So this is Choose Your Own Adventure, um, probably a pretty familiar sounding theme. I'm talking about how um, I've been using flexible pathways and proficiency-based learning in my classroom over the last few years, and in particular what I've found to be successful. So um, the reason I've got the Act 77, Three Pillars of Personalized Learning graphic on there is that, um, in short, I, I'm honored to be an educator in Vermont. Act 77 as a law is what's kind of, I think, nudging a lot of educators to be more progressive and take more healthy risks in our practice. And so I'm thankful that it's been a part of what has really kind of reinvented my practice over the last few years. Um, so that's why I kind of under Act 77, we're going to be talking about uh, proficiency-based learning. That's why you've got the, the learning target on there. Um, we're going to be talking about flexible pathways. Service learning is one of the, uh, the, you know, the avenues through which we've used it. And of course, we'll be talking about this year, even how we address the election this fall. And of course, resources, and then the student panel. I can get out of their way and let these guys talk. So, um, background of proficiency-based learning. Um, again, keeping it short, it's been quite a journey the past few years. Um, the learning targets on the left, kind of, even though you know it's going to be too much to unpack and look through those. In short, it's that you know three years ago I was using the Vermont GEs for those of you that remember those and Common Core standards and basing learning targets off of those and having a lot of um, grandiose failures in doing so, but learning about how learning targets at the core of what you do can work. Um, even last year, I had moved to district-based learning targets within social studies. We called them five uh, inquiry skills for social studies. And it was kind of a step in the right direction, but they were still very content-based. So this year, I've had a lot of success in moving to true transferable skills sharing them out amongst my colleagues across uh, content areas, all of them connected to, within our district, the five transferable skills, but kind of the same transferable standards that, the, that Vermont's putting out, you know, the informed and integrated thinking, um, you know, responsible citizenship, self-direction. Um, so, you know, my own evolution has kind of been making those more articulate, but um, in practice, for growing independence, that's where I've also made a lot of strides. You know, I think, again, going back three years ago, I became good at making learning targets and kind of slapping them on an assignment. And that's great and all, and you feel like you're communicating what the expectations are, but it's not really enough. You're not really, uh, you know, kind of helping students develop skills. Last year, I worked really hard at making the learning targets and the expectations connected to them very articulate so I could put work in front of these students and say, guys, it's so clear what you have to do to be successful. I'm doing such a good job of supporting your growth. Last thing on this slide I want to point out is down in the bottom right over by Rory, you've got the, it says you, we, us, I. That might sound like um, some strange jargon, but really that model encapsulates what it's like, this, this format of practicing. So the you refers to this guy. Usually when we look, look at a new skill, say patterns and trends, for example, I will model the skill and kind of show them what it means to get a one, two, three, or four in a learning target. The we, you guys are familiar with this, is when as a group we will practice the skill in a formative way. Nothing formal, nothing that goes in the books, but the opportunity to practice the skill, get some group feedback. Same with the us. The us is usually more like partners or small groups where, again, they're practicing again, trying to refine their skill, which finally goes down to the I, where the students themselves do things uh, for you know an independent summative grade that will be formally assessed. Big picture with all this, one thing that I've taken away from my learning the last few years, more feedback, less grading. You guys don't have any grades in the books this year. I haven't heard many complaints about it, by the way. But um, the idea being that by the time something's actually assessed in a summative way, most of these students have had the chance to master it. Um, and those that don't will have more opportunities to do so because these are year-long Really, in most cases, these are middle school long transferable skills. The thing that changes is the complexity of the content through which we apply the skills. You notice the I is the last step where it's I, the student, doing the work and, and doing these things independently. We used to have a backwards where the I was the teacher and it was a student who finally gave me the light bulb moment that said, wait, Mr. Nelson, shouldn't the I be like me? But, um, okay, so background of flexible pathways, kind of the same story. Um, you know, a lot of bumps along the road, a lot of mistakes made, love that stuff. That's called learning. So. Um, over the past three years, I have found, you know, I found how successful it is when students have choice and voice in the curriculum and when you make curriculum a conversation, not a mandate. And so service learning is up there because uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the service learning model, you could do a whole session, you could do a whole day on service learning, but um, it really puts student choice and wanting to connect to the community and an authentic audience at the core of what you do. And you gotta be flexible because what these guys will be able to tell you about um, for the seventh graders that when we got to do this last year, 
it's tough, it takes a lot of negotiation, and sometimes it even takes me getting into a little bit of trouble, kind of connecting with community members. So, um, all really good part of learning. Do you want to add something, Rory? Service learning, last year we did kind of a mini unit on it, and um, I was in a group where we did, we were focusing on saving the ocean aspect. Um, so we ended up going and presenting to most of the uh, elementary school, and we also um, had like an article in the newspaper so um, it just in a connected way, like um, you know, the Google Doc down below that says going green, that's just an example of um, how I love my role as a teacher becomes really charting and tracking the conversation. There's a ton of student-led discussions, and I mean student-led, where I literally remove myself from the discussion, sit on the outskirts, and just track the discussion digitally, because I'm a pretty quick um, keyboardist. So um, those are really powerful when the students even struggle at times with conducting their own discussion and struggle with facilitation or talking over each other. And sometimes I sit back and let them struggle because they learn through that. And what's inspiring is that by the end of the year, they actually can't wait for me to get out of the way because they want to just have a student-led discussion where I'm doing nothing but, again, tracking it so when we can come back to it, I've got kind of a log of their notes. Um, Connected to that, you know, I mentioned student voice and choice, a huge part of this. Um, just over the last few years, experimenting with different things, from having students help me design what's an actual assessment going to look like, to unit-long um, student-designed curriculum, where we kind of talk about what the overall themes are going to be, but they help me design what are we going to explore, what's our learning going to look like, what's the product of our learning going to look like. Again, always student-led, always tracked by me, and really making it a conversation. And then. Um, the picture down at the bottom is an example where a student actually asked me if she could teach a lesson. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fact that Hamilton, the rage, is like, take, it's like, it's taken over the country, which of course as a social studies teacher I'm so into. So she asked when we were doing um, an American Revolution unit if she could do a, a lesson on Hamilton. She taught um, every student on her whole team. And it was, it was so inspiring where I got to sit in the back and be a student and just take pictures and track what she did. So um, it's all there. And then finally, the SPC, which, um, so SPC is an acronym that stands for Student Planning Committee. Some of our panel members today are on the 6th and 7th grade SPC. Totally a new thing this year that I've started where we meet usually every week or at least every other week and we talk curriculum. And I told them up front that those that want to be a part of this, they volunteer. I told them what they're getting into. At best, they might get a little bit of chocolate out of it, but there aren't a lot of frills to go along with it. Um, but we meet, and they help inform my instruction. And the thing I promised them is that I wouldn't sit them down, listen to their ideas, say, guys, that's so cute, and then do nothing to change. Um, they've, they've had actual like marked changes within our curriculum in the sense that even um, the, the docudrama film projects we just did, that was entirely put on by students. None of that would have been my idea. You want to jump in Yeah, here? someone um, recommended it while we were talking about like how you could learn about um, like information about the revolutions. And so Mr. Nelson took on upon that idea and he decided to make a unit about um, like information about the um, about a revolution that we choose or that we were interested in. And um, mine was on the Cuban Revolution and I, I've learned so much from doing. Thanks, Gabe. We'll talk about that too. Okay, so again, trying to be really quick. Moving on. All right, so um, talking about this year, we did we started the fall, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade on the winter team at Shelburne Community School. We looked at the election. Um, I'm gonna keep this brief, but you can see on the left side we've got note taking. And then on the right side, we've got discipline-specific vocabulary. Those are the only two transferable skills that we actually practiced, used in exploring the election, and these students were graded in a formal, summative manner. But we explored so much, and we did a lot of different, uh, we looked at a lot of different stuff. I think the challenge that people have with wrapping their heads around transferable skills and maybe proficiency-based learning in, in general is where does the content go? Well, I can tell you firsthand. These guys can tell you better than I can. We looked at a ton of content with this election, so in short, with note taking, kind of the method of, of practice was, uh, again, me modeling the behavior, giving them a, a resource where it shows different types of notes. Notes can look and, and take the shape of a lot of different things. Having them work in groups, give each other feedback, then having them practice. You guys remember note taking bingo? We had a bingo board where there were different um, major issues connected to the election. It might be things like immigration, um, women's rights, gun control. They kind of work their way through a bingo board, but in doing so, they have to try all four of the um, note-taking strategies that we were practicing. All that practice, all of it ungraded, but with a lot of really good feedback, so that by the time they did their political platform summative projects and they had to have notes connected to the research, 
these guys were all masters. And it was really, again, it was inspiring for me to see how successful um, all, you know, all students from sixth to eighth grade were in tracking notes and making them you know, detailed and nuanced and really insightful. Um, this one specific vocabulary was similar. We had vocabulary, we rolled it out, practiced it in a few ways before anything went into the books. Um, and even using um, tech tools like Quizlet was fantastic because Quizlet not only is there an engaging and fun way to practice something like vocab, especially when it's ungraded, it becomes more like that game-based learning thing where you can attach a score to it, keep a scoreboard going, and get these guys motivated to, to mm -hmm. learn and try to master it when they don't have to worry about bombing and failing and having a nasty grade in the book that looks awful. So, um, and Quizlet works nicely too in that you could set up four different levels. Mm -hmm. So you kind of work your way up from starting, stepping up, pro status is great, and then of course, ninja level, for those of you that are really nailing it. Um, <laughs> that all built up again to then they had to use that discipline specific vocabulary in their political platform project. So, those platform projects themselves, a lot of student voice and choice there. Um, what they could be, what they were based on was uh, election issues, but again, they could look like anything. People made PSAs, infomercials, posters, people wrote letters, tons of different ways that they could basically express their understanding about um, major election issues. So super successful, and again, the whole authentic audience piece at the end was that we connected with a different team, one of whom, teacher here, Eric Brodvan, is on that team, where we actually swapped. So everyone on our team laid out their, uh, you know, in a gallery, their political platform projects. We went over to Holden where theirs were set up and then we had a little voting sheet. So there's a little bit more of that authentic audience piece and even simulating a little bit of the election. Um, the only other things I'll throw out there is, yeah, you know, on top of all this, we looked closely at the electoral college. We did electoral geography. Yeah. Gabe here was one of the two students. Yeah. Who are you comfortable with me sharing this? Yeah. You want to tell them what you did? Oh uh, yeah. So we had an electoral college test where we had to name a certain amount of states with all with their capitals and their electoral college votes, and we had to place them in the right place. And you could start from starting to stepping up to pro status to ninja level. And so I studied, and I thought, and I thought I could do ninja level. And so I, um. The day after, like we did our, we found out our results. Um, I found out that I got all the answers right because you would get a certain amount of points for naming the correct electoral college votes, um, the state capitals, and the placement of states, and, and the electoral college. Yeah. It was impressive. So just you know, just to put it out there, like every single state on a map, every state capital, and every electoral college vote. Anyone here know many, how many electoral college votes Arizona has? Rock on. Six. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so impressive stuff, right? And again, like none of it, none of it graded. All really just kind of game based. We had kind of a leaderboard going. Um, the only challenge was time because, like, it would take a whole forty-five minute class yeah. for Gabe, Gabe to fill out a whole map. So, um, as always, like time became the challenge. But okay, Emma's giving me the nudge. We're moving on. We're going to talk about um, the other major unit that has kind of combined proficiency-based learning and flexible pathways, and it's our new one that we're living now. You say you want a revolution. Looking at revolutions through time. Got some learning targets up here, citing sources and participation. You know, you've got kind of a, a habit of learning there and participation or a soft skill as people call it. Citing sources, of course, a very fundamental skill. Two things that we practice formatively, citing sources, you guys have a book that's going, or a grade that's going to the books. Patterns and trends is what most recently we had a really, I did anyway, very teachery, but I had a very fun time rolling out the, uh, the, the you, we, us, I. You want to explain the flower? So Do it. For patterns and trends, I just know this because this is the flower that my group made. The stem was where you put in the trend, like for us specifically, like our trend was that every person in our group started gradually listening to more music since the beginning of the school year. And we specified in each of the leaves, like the patterns, like each of us put in like who we listened to and then like how we listened to it and then the dirt or yeah, the so dirt or nutrients <laughs> was um, put in as like what you do and maybe what some of the not so great things about it. So looking at it from both sides, some of ours were <coughs> it helps us for like it's a hobby, entertainment, and sometimes for at least myself it helps for, like relieve stress just when you're having a hard time just listening to music, and then. Some of the things that were not so great is that you plug in headphones and you tune yourself out. Um, and then the top is just 
what your prediction is. So what you think might happen. And our prediction was music's going to become more involved in our society. And then you say, so I suggest this to some people. Like, I you suggest to unplug more often or even listen to music without headphones with a group of friends or at a school dance. Like, listen to music with a group of people so you're not plugged, like, not plugged in because you're with people doing it and in the world at the same time. I think so. So, yeah, I would say the reason that I, as a teacher, liked it, but I certainly am really enjoying that the students get it and, and comprehend what's going on is that it's a four-step project, these, these lovely flowers, but each step in the flower project is one step on the learning target. So you, you can't get a more tangible and clear look at what it means to be a one, two, three, or four on this patterns and trends learning target. And again, um, some people kind of fa failed on this one, but it was, uh, it was the, you know, it was the you, it was the we. So like it was in a group and um, we'll be practicing again, moving towards independence. So helpful so resources. Um, some of this might look really familiar, but you know, there's the project-based learning book, Power of the Adolescent Brain by Thomas Armstrong. It's unbelievable, Total, totally into the brain-based learning piece, and it's very inspiring when you think about how you want to roll out content to these guys. The Excited to Learn book by, uh, by Marjorie Ginsburg was kind of what inspired me to bring on the SPC, because that student planning committee, again, having them that, connected, clo that closely connected to what we're doing is, is so helpful. I'm never going to not have that again. Um, and then, of course, CVU learns the Tarrant blog because, man, they're good at just like putting out the net, taking the coolest things going on the state, and then putting it out there. I learned so much from it. Buck Institute, PLP Pathways. Okay, there's your plug. So, <laughs> yeah. how did your flower, was your flower part of the revolution unit, or was that two different? Well, we wanted to do, well, we were doing the flowers. That's, that was the, in the UESI. That was kind of like the us form of that, because that was our small groups. There was groups of three or four. And because when we do, so we all made these docudramas about these revolutions, is what the, like, they were called, docudramas. And um, so next week, we're going to have a film festival of sorts. And during that, everyone's good, like, at the very end of seeing every single video, you're gonna be able that you're gonna sit down by yourself and say, here's was here's the pattern that we, like all the that all these revolution or the trends that all these revolutions had, and then like what and like what your prediction is like these happened like how many years apart for these reasons? I wonder if this will happen again. I suggest this to maybe not have it happen or something so like that. So you make your own flower with new leaves based on the trends of revolution. Yes, got it. Thank you. How has this changed, like this type of learning changed your relationship with school? Like, it seems like you all are like super excited about what you're doing and being in class and like even coming here. Like, how do you feel about school now differently than maybe previously? Sophia, Abby, we have a you guys want to jump on that one? I guess, I think it's easier with like first instead of just handing you work and saying like here's the targets do it it's easier when he kind of like shows us a little more of examples of how to do it and then we kind of work together as a class to kind of learn more about it and just ease our way in and then kind of go off on our own and do it instead of just handing the work and saying do it i just building off that i definitely enjoy a choice too so to be able to create something that's not just the specific you're answering questions or something like that, you're, uh, you're, you're creating something that's more unique. And, um, for me, I like the standards-based learning more because um, like before when we would take tests and stuff, if we would have a question for a teacher, they couldn't really answer it <laughs> um, because they're like, well, how do I answer this without giving you, like, telling you what to do? Um, and with the standards, it makes it a lot clearer what you have to do because it pretty much tells you exactly how to do, like, step by step, and then you just pretty much have to do the work. It sounds like you guys feel less stressed out yeah. when summatives come along. I think the hard thing is that I know a lot of people that will try to connect a grade average to a standard. Oh, yeah, 3 is 85 to 75. Like, that's not, or 75 to 85, that's not really how it works. And that can get really hard to try and explain. Like, mm -hmm. like a mom saying, oh yeah, you only got a two, what's wrong? Like you can get up to a four. And like, 
but that means you just need you need one more practice before you take the summative. You need one more practice, and then you can get the three or potentially even the four. And the four is you're exceeding. Like you understand this, you could like do it whenever to any topic. Like, and just does, right? And like it's just <laughs> it's difficult sometimes just with that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. When like with the transferable or with making a learning target, um. It, it it also just makes it a lot easier because you have so much more time to practice and you are a lot more ready for the summative than you would be if you had it like right at the start of the year. Yeah, it's called the SPC, right? the committee that yeah. helps with curriculum. Can you talk about like how those meetings work and what voice you get? Um, so we kind of like, Mr. Nelson generally has some sort of agenda that we don't stick to, but um, <laughs> it's like a general, like he's got some ideas for projects or stuff and then we discuss it and like say what we agree with and what we disagree with, like, but sometimes also if there's something that he's doing that we really don't like, we're going to be like, you're boring us with this, please can we change it and do something else? Um, and generally we have some sort of idea and we help to make sense of things more for other students. Get ready, people. This one's gonna drop. Trying to exceed the standard with this one. Yeah, here we go. Where's my learning target? I'm about to teach you all something very important about standards. So here's an introduction to standards-based learning. A chance to answer all those questions you've had burning. It's different than A's, there's no hundred point scale. To understand the difference, now just listen to my tale. It all starts with standards, or as I call them, skills. If learning is like money, then standards are the bills. Practice makes perfect, through and through. The way we do this is with I, we, you, you. The I means me, the teacher that is. The we means we practice, teacher and kids. The first you is partners, working side by side. The final you is independent, skills are bona fide. Now let's talk about reports, how we communicate. What counts is what you do, not just on time or late. On any given task, students demonstrate the ability to produce or to create. Talking standards. From a one to a four letter grades don't matter. Proficiency matters more. We're talking standards. Even if you have both, what's an A anyway? What really counts a student growth? We're talking standards. From a one to a four letter grades don't matter. Proficiency matters more. We're talking standards. Even if you have both, what's an A anyway? What really counts a student growth? He knows what's up. He always sends units to the follow up. The standards based learning may, may be a pain, but really it's still gonna help your brain. So, Mr. Nelson, did I earn a four? Well, let's see. Did you achieve the standard plus more? I went deeper, beyond grade level for the task. Then I think you know the answer. You don't even need to ask. We're talking standards. From a one to a four letter grades don't matter. Proficiency matters more. We're talking standards. Even if you have both, both, both what's an A anyway? What really counts a student growth? We're grow. talking standards. From a one to a four letter grades don't matter. Proficiency matters more. We're talking standards. Even if you have both, both, both what's an A anyway? What really counts a student growth? Just memorizing facts well, I'm about done with all of that But learn new skills then apply them We're talking standards based learning Say
Target learning. Target learning. Target. When I say demonstrate, you say efficiency. Demonstrate. Efficiency. Demonstrate. Efficiency. 